present uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Hilary Graves, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of Oxford. Uh, her current research focuses on various issues in ethics. Uh, her interests include the national issues in consequentialism, issues of aggregation, uh, egalitarianism, anti anti-egalitarianist approach, uh, population ethics, effective altruism, the interface between ethics and economics, the analogies between ethics and epistemology, and formal epistemology. Uh, she currently directs the project Population Ethics Theory and Practice, funded by the Leverkusen Trust, and she's also the director of the Global Priorities Institute. Please uh, well, uh, help me in joining uh, welcoming Hilary Cruz. The theme of this conference is doing good together. What exactly does this mean? In this talk, I want to disentangle two quite different things that it could mean uh, that are apt to be conflated with one another if we're not careful. The first one I'll call collectivism. This has been the focus of an often repeated criticism of the effective altruist movement um, over the years. Um, here the idea is that effective altruism errs in focusing only on what the individual can achieve by themselves, as it were, and not in focusing on what the community can achieve as a whole. I mean, we all know this, right? This is why effective altruists are so into these sticking plaster interventions like distributing malaria nets, and why they never actually try to fix the underlying problem that caused the need for malaria nets in the first place. Okay, so that's the first idea, collectivism. Quite a different thing is coordination, which is about the extent to which we should be talking to one another and making joint plans when we decide what to do. What I'm going to be arguing is that the collectivist criticism of effective altruism is confused. I'm going to be arguing that we do not, at a fundamental level, need to be asking what the group can achieve rather than what the individual can achieve. Um, however, that's not to say that we don't need to be thinking about coordinating. So I think the organisers of this conference, when they talk about doing good together, are actually mostly or entirely talking about coordination. So they're saying the thing that I agree with, but many critics of effective altruism have been saying the thing I disagree with, and it's important that we don't get sucked into their claws. Okay, so, what are these two ideas? Collectivism, as I indicated, is the idea that in certain decision situations, in particular in the context of attempting to solve some of the biggest problems that face the world, we find ourselves in this maybe peculiar situation where it's true of every individual who might try to intervene on that problem, that that individual's marginal contribution makes not only a small difference, but actually precisely no difference um, to the extent to which the problem gets solved. Whereas, when we consider a thousand, a million, a billion people engaging in similar actions simultaneously, now we've got a sufficiently large group that we can make a difference. Many people think this, for example, about the problem of climate change, where we consider the question of whether, if we're worried about climate change, there's a case for each of us individually to try to reduce our carbon footprint. Many people feel some kind of moral call towards reducing their carbon footprint, but at the same time, some kind of puzzlement as to whether there's really any point in doing so. And the puzzlement comes from this idea that one individual reducing their carbon footprint is going to make literally no difference to the problem of climate change. This is perhaps arguably suggested by Barack Obama, for instance. Obama was asked by one of his constituents, I mean, President Obama, um, I want you to tell me not what you're doing about climate change politically speaking, but what are you doing about climate change in your personal life? To which Obama is reported to have responded, well, Brian, we can't solve global warming because I effing changed light bulbs in my house. It's because of something collective. Another example where you might think you have this phenomenon, no individual can make a difference, but the group can, um, is in the context of campaigning for revolution, political change, structural reform. So consider, for example, the 1963 March on Washington. This was an event in which one quarter of a million people marched on the White House demanding black rights. And that event is widely credited with partially bringing about the US 1964 Civil Rights Act. Imagine yourself now in the shoes of one of those people in that mass demonstration. Suppose that he decided whether or not to join the demonstration by asking, do I think that my contribution to this demonstration will make a difference? There too, it's easy, at least easy to get into a frame of mind where you think, no, my joining the demonstration, the difference between a quarter of a million people and a quarter of a million plus one people, that's going to make precisely no difference, one might think, 
to the degree of success of the demonstration. And therefore, if each individual was making their decisions on the basis of asking what difference their actions, their individual actions would make, rather than perhaps by asking the question of what difference the actions of the whole collective would make, maybe the individual would fail to see the case for joining protests like the 1963 March on Washington. But this is the kind of thing the collectivist thinks. I've tried to present it sympathetically, but I'm still later going to be arguing against this. What do I want to contrast it with? So I wanted to draw this distinction between what I'm calling collectivism on the one hand and coordination on the other hand. So let me tr try now to pull these two things apart. So collectivism, again, is about what kind of agents we're focusing on. The collectivist idea is that if you're focusing on individual agents and you're interested in the question of making a difference, then you're going to fail to see the case for action on things that require, say, political change, because in those cases, the only kind of agent that can make any difference is a group agent, not an individual agent. A quite different claim, the coordination claim, is not about which kind of agents we're talking about, it's instead about which kind of actions we're considering. Um, so suppose now that we are asking the question of how the individual can best make a difference. There are different kind of actions the individual might try to take in order to make a difference. Some actions are ones that can be evaluated, as it were, with the blinkers on, that is to say, without paying any attention to anything that other like-minded individuals are doing. Whereas other actions are more collaborative. So, you know, one thing that you might try to do is fund malaria nets. A different thing that you might try to do, say, is organize a political campaign where you talk to other potentially like-minded people and try to cause them to do certain things. Um, so the coordination claim is that we need these um, individual actions that involve trying to coordinate with other like-minded agenda, uh, other like-minded people, to be on the agenda when we're deciding how the individual can best make a difference. So that second thing I'm not going to be taking any issue with, um, but it's importantly different from the first thing, and I am going to argue against the first thing. First, let me convince you that I'm not just attacking a straw man here. So here is a person who says the thing that I disagree with. This is only a Srinivasan, a moral philosopher, and the quote is from a piece she wrote called Stop the Robot Apocalypse, which is her critical review of William McCaskill's book, Doing Good Better. The robots, by the way, are the effective altruists. <laughs> so Srinivasan says, there is a small paradox in the growth of effective altruism as a movement when it is so profoundly individualistic. The tacit assumption is that the individual, not the community, class, or state, is the proper object of moral theorizing. There are benefits to thinking this way, she now continues somewhat sarcastically. If everything comes down to the marginal individual, then our ethical ambitions can be safely circumscribed. The philosopher is freed from the burden of trying to understand the mess we're in, or of proposing an alternative vision of how things could be. Okay, so there, the bit that I've put in bold face and underlined is this idea that what the effective altruist is doing is talking about individual agents and not group agents, and then from that she draws the consequence that this is why the effect of altruists fails to see the case for political change and just obsesses about malaria next all the time. <coughs> What's the right response to that sort of criticism? First, I want to highlight two short responses that might be and have been given, um, but I only want to mention these in order to set them aside. The first short response would be to say that this criticism attacks a straw man, that is to say, it's not in fact true that the that effective altruists ask only what individual agents can achieve and not on what group agents can achieve. I think there's some truth to that, but as I said, I want to set it aside. I also want to set aside a second short response one might give. Um, it's also something I have some sympathy with, um, although it's incompatible with the first. The second short response says, well, you know, it's true that effective altruists are only asking what difference the individual can make. However, they're correct to do so. So this suggestion is floated by Jeff McMahon in his response to Srinivasan. Uh, McMahon says, look, I am neither a community nor a state. I can determine only what I will do, not what my community or state will do. So there is the idea that, you know, yeah, maybe it is true that the individual can't make any difference to issues of political reform. But if so, that's a very good reason for not trying to do so. I can only affect my own actions. So that is indeed the thing I should be focusing on. I think there's a lot more to be said about both of these responses, and I don't necessarily disagree with either of them. But the reason I want to set them aside is that they implicitly concede too much to the collectivist critic. And I think the thing we should be really doing is pushing back on the more fundamental thing, 
um, in the collectivist picture. The thing that it concedes and should not concede is that the collectivist conditional claim is true, where the conditional claim is if you were focusing only on individual agents, then that would necessarily lead you to fail to see the case for action on political change. That's the thing I think we should more fundamentally push back on. So let me have a go at doing that. To do so, I want to pull a trick that philosophers often pull, and that often annoys non-philosophers. So let me say what the trick is, and say why you shouldn't be annoyed by it. It's a reasonable thing to be doing. The trick is to retreat temporarily from all the messy complexities of real-world scenarios, and stipulate that we're talking about um, a very clean, simple, hypothetical case. So I'm going to be talking about an imagined world, bearing some resemblance to the real world, but because it's my own imagined world, I get to stipulate away various complexities um, of how things actually pan out in the real case. The motivation for doing this is it's a tool for clarification. It's a bit like when the physical scientist you know, fundamentally wants to investigate something like the laws of Newtonian mechanics, but if you try to do that in a real world, there's all kind of mess going on, you know, there's wind interference, there's friction, blah, blah, blah. So instead of trying to do your experiments in a field, you construct a laboratory where you can screen off lots of the complexities, investigate things in a nice simple scenario, and then use the understanding you thereby gain to figure out better what's actually going on in the real world. So the philosopher is just doing an analogue of that thing. Let us talk about the simple cases first so we can clarify the fundamentals, then we'll go back to the real world, hopefully with a superior level of understanding. Okay, so here's the hypothetical case I want to talk about. A case of vegetarianism. Suppose for the sake of argument we all agree that chicken deaths are bad, and suppose that for this reason, if the situation we were in was one of having to go to the farm and saying to the farmer, you know, I fancy a chicken for my dinner tonight, so please kill that one there, and then the farmer duly rings the neck of the chicken and we take it home and cook it for dinner, suppose we all agree that in that decision situation we would not buy the chicken because we think that whatever pleasure we might get from eating chicken is massively outweighed by the amount of badness involved in the chicken death. Okay, so far so good. What now of a different decision situation? One that's actually a bit more like the one we are actually in when we consider buying chickens. Vegetarianism in the supermarket. So consider now a case where the setup is such that you, know, you go to the supermarket, you consider whether or not to buy a chicken from the butcher's counter, and suppose for the sake of argument you know that the way this supermarket works is it's going to order another 25 chickens from, say, the farm, the slaughterhouse, with the result that another chicken, 25 chickens will be killed every time the 25th chicken is sold. So if you're, say, you know, the third or the 29th person, you buying a chicken doesn't trigger any more chicken deaths, but if you happen to be the 25th person or the 50th person, that triggers another 25 chicken deaths. Um, so suppose that many people buy one chicken each, you're considering whether or not to join their ranks, and for the sake of argument, let's stipulate that on the day in question, precisely 578 people buy a chicken from the supermarket in question. But no individual knows this, so you as the individual shopper, at the time of your decision, don't have access to that information. You just know it's a pretty big supermarket, and you know, who knows how many chicken purchases there are going to be in total. Okay, so the question now is, do you still have the same kind of reason in this decision situation to refrain from buying a chicken, as you did in the situation where you had to buy it from the farm and directly cause its death? It looks like the situation might be relevantly different, or at least the collectivist thinks it is. So the collectivist thinks, no, in the supermarket case, if you're asking about the effect of the marginal individual, if you're just asking what difference you make by buying a chicken, then you won't see the case for being, vegetarianism, for being vegetarian, because it's overwhelmingly unlikely, at least, in that scenario, that your buying one chicken is going to make any difference at all to the number of chickens that get killed. However, this whole big group of 578 people chooses to buy chickens versus not. So you might think that this is a case that by collectivist rights is relevantly similar to the situation of, say, joining a campaign for political reform. Okay, so I'm going to be arguing against this picture. Before I do so, maybe some people will find it helpful if I just draw it on a graph. So in this graph, the vertical axis represents the total amount of harm done by all chicken purchasers put together. So in this case, total amount of harm done is number of chicken deaths, while the horizontal axis represents the total number of people, including yourself if you join in, who buy chickens on the day in question. 
What does that graph look like? Well, in the case of the farm, it was pretty much a straight line. Each extra person buying one chicken caused a small increase in the amount of harm. That was the straightforward case. What's happening in the case of the supermarket is that we have this staircase function. So most individuals, if they're in the location of the, um, the first white arrow on that screen, what most marginal individuals do if they buy a chicken is just shift us slightly along one of the horizontal steps. So they increase the number of chickens that get bought, but they don't even by a tiny amount increase the amount of chicken suffering or the number of chicken deaths. Whereas if you happen to be the 25th person or the 50th or the 75th, then you cause 25 extra chicken, chicken deaths because you cause us to go up another step on this staircase function. Okay, so that's just saying the same things on a graph. How should we think about these decisions? So what I want to try and convince you of is that the way the collectivist is thinking, when the collectivist draws this model that this is a situation where no individual makes a difference and yet the collective does, so we have to be thinking irreducibly about group agents in order to see the point of being vegetarian, that picture is confused. And the reason it's confused is it's confused about the question of what's the right approach to decision making under uncertainty. When you think carefully about how to make rational decisions, when you're uncertain, as you are here, um, about what the outcome of your decision will be, the standard answer is that one ought to maximize expected value. What do we mean by that? Well, we mean that the rational decision maker is supposed to consider, in turn, all of the possible outcomes of their actions. In this case, there are two possible outcomes, zero additional chicken deaths or 25 additional chicken deaths. Then you're supposed to assign probabilities to these various possible outcomes, and you're supposed to assign numbers to the outcomes representing how good or bad they are, so val assign values to the outcomes. And then you're supposed to choose whichever action, in this case, buying the chickens or not, maximizes, quote, expected value, where expected value is the probability weighted average of the possible values that might result from your action. So when we do this calculation for the vegetarianism in the supermarket example, what we end up doing is first saying, well, there was a chance of 24 out of 25 that my action resulted in no additional chicken death. So that's 24 over 25 times zero. Okay, that part's zero. However, I have to add one over 25 um, multiplied by the badness of 25 chicken deaths, because I have a chance of 1 over 25 of causing 25 more chickens to be killed. What's the result of that calculation? Well, it means that the, uh, the expected badness resulting from my purchase is equivalent to one chicken death. That is to say, from the point of view that's relevant for rational and moral decision making, there is in the end no relevant difference between the case of buying a chicken directly from the farm and the case of buying a chicken from the supermarket, at least the way that I've, the simple way that I've stipulated the case goes for my example. So because of this, I think it's just not true in any sense that's relevant to decision that the individual makes no difference. The individual's action does make a difference to the amount of expected value in, in the world. And once you recognize this, you have no remaining sense of the so-called collectivist paradox. Okay, what about the real world? Or maybe there's one more thing I should say about chickens before I go back to political reform cases. You can imagine a situation in which it really would be true, or at least it looks like it really would be true, that the individual makes no difference. That will be a situation in which the individual is already certain at the time of decision, not only what shape this graph has, specifically that the steps occur precisely every 25 purchasers, but is also sure of how many other chicken purchasers there will be today um, other than herself. If you were in that epi em epistemic situation, and if it was in fact true that the chicken deaths get triggered every 25 chicken purchases, and that the number of chicken purchases besides yourself is, say, 578, then you really could be sure that your buying a chicken would make no difference to the number of chicken deaths. And furthermore, it could be the case that every other person in that supermarket is in the same epistemic situation. So it could be true of all 579 of you at the same time that no, none of your individual actions makes any difference to the number of chickens who die, and yet the actions of the collective do. So I'm not ruling out that possibility. The important question for our purposes, though, is which of these possibilities is more relevantly similar to the scenarios we're actually interested in um, which are things like, well, you know, real world versions of the vegetarianism case for what, on the one hand, but also things like political reform, joining mass demonstrations, organizing mass demonstrations, that kind of thing on the other hand. I think it's just completely implausible to suppose that cases like climate change and political reform 
are relevantly similar to the nice, clean version of the vegetarianism case, where you can be absolutely certain that your action has no difference. Consider for a minute what it would take for that to be the case. It would have to be the case um, for the march on Washington. Um, firstly, that they knew the graph of the degree of success of the political campaign um, graphed against the number of people who take part in the demonstration. Okay, well, we know that graph has a kind of upward trend, right? Because we know that in general, very large political demonstrations get taken more notice of than very small political demonstrations. It is important, after all, that the March on Washington included a quarter of a million people and not two and a half thousand people. But what we don't plausibly know is precisely where the steps occur on that graph. And even if we did, it wouldn't be any help to us because no individual demonstrator, when deciding whether or not to join the demonstration, has any precise idea of how many demonstrators there will end up being aside from herself. So for both of these reasons, the situation she's in is the situation of decision-making under uncertainty, where she's forced to evaluate her individual actions in expected value terms. And as soon as you're doing that, you're going to see the case for um, individual action on these complex questions, even if you are just focusing on individual agents and not on group agents. Okay, so in conclusion then, what I've argued is that Asking only what difference the individual can make rather than what difference the group can make should not prevent you, if you're doing your reasoning correctly, it should not prevent you from capturing the case for collective action um, on things like political reform and climate change. I want to add a small conciliatory remark. I mean, here's a thing that I think is true. As a psychological matter, it may well be easier to grasp, it may well be easier to accurately evaluate the expected value of your individual actions if you ask yourself the question of, well, you know, what would happen if a million people did this? You know, if you can magnify things by a factor of a million in your mind, they become much bigger, that makes them much easier to see. It might be the case that when you consider that question, your intuitions are more accurate. So there might be that kind of psychological reason for imagining the scaled up collective version of the question. But acknowledging that is importantly distinct um, from getting the underlying logical point wrong. The underlying logical point is that if you could do the reasoning correctly, um, then you would get the right answer. You would see that in expectation individuals make a difference, even when you do just consider the case of the, the effects of the actions of one person taken separately. The thing I'm not denying, though, is the coordination claim. So this, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the claim that uh, we'd better not have too blinkered an approach to the question of what kind of action should be on the individual's agenda. It may well be the case that the best thing that you as an individual can do in expected value terms, that is in terms of how much expected value you by your individual actions can add to the world, it may well be that the actions that win that expected value competition are actions that involve coordinating with other potentially like-minded people rather than actions that are more unilateral, whatever precisely that would mean. So certainly these actions that involve coordination have to be on the effective altruist's agenda. But acknowledging that is not the same thing as saying that we have to be thinking irreducibly in terms of the agent being the collective rather than a, a group of individuals. Thanks.